So the next speaker I know quite well. Um, I know him actually for some 70 years now. Um, he started research 40 years ago and somehow, stubbornly enough, he always stuck with the same topic, namely uh, immunity to intracellular bacteria. He started at the bench and then went to the bed and now he's actually doing both bench and bed. So I introduce to you the professor for microbiology and immunology at the Charité University Hospitals in Berlin at the director at the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in Berlin, Stefan Kaufmann. So now I have to move here. And now I start. Thank you so much for these kind words. And um, uh, thank you so much for your applause, actually. And I, I got given a task which is really enormous to talk to, um, about an infectious agent. And I um, very kind of courageously called it the most successful pathogen. I know this is kind of provocative. We may discuss that. But I give you one reason why I thought that it's appropriate. And I was told I should talk about everything, biomarkers, host-directed therapy, and vaccines. Actually, that's not correct. I'm not talking about everything, because drugs, of course, are still also very important. But I will cover these fields somehow and focus on biomarkers or systems biology, as it was called today, and vaccines, but also give some evidences for, oops, uh, some indications for uh, host-directed therapy. Now, this is the slide from Nature, the 2013, which made me claim that this is a very, if not the most, successful pathogen. Um, over the last 200 years, one pathogen has killed more people in the world than any other infectious agent. Actually, it's more than smallpox, malaria, plague, influenza, cholera, and AIDS together. And that's one billion people who died of TB over the last 200 years. Now, you may say, this is the past. Who's interested in the last 200 years? Unfortunately, that is not the case. And even today, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the agent of tuberculosis, kills more people than any other infectious agents. Now, there's a lot of talking nowadays about antimicrobial resistance. And normally, most people, at least in Europe and the US, would think about hospital infections, opportunistic infections. But in fact, actually, it's again multidrug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's the number one killer amongst all AMR bed bugs. And that's about 20% of all deaths of the bed bugs by the antimicrobial resistant microorganisms that's um, um, caused by mycobacterium TB. But still, I'm open for discussion whether there are other successes, and that is not the point here. <laughs> So everybody agrees nowadays, if you want to change that scenario, we need better intervention measures. And there is clearly a question, why do we need better intervention measures? Because we have diagnostics for 130 years. We have drugs for 70 years. We have a vaccine for more than 90 years. And they all work but they are not good enough. And the pathogen, as we heard today, actually develops further. And it's the pathogen that's quicker than human brain. And therefore, we have these resistance problems. We have a vaccine that's not really working as well as we would like it. And um, of course, the diagnostics also need a lot of improvements. And it's clearly also not sufficient. And I will make the point that we need two more pillars. And these two no new kits and the, on the block are biosignatures and host direct therapy that will take a long way. They should be considered in addition to the canonical intervention measures, but I think they are needed and indeed actually they should all work together. Now, HDD, host-directed therapy, and biomarkers actually are somehow intertwined, and biosignatures clearly can help also in the development of drugs and vaccines, as I will show you. And host-directed therapy, of course, is something in between drugs and vaccines. Think of passive vaccination, which is a kind of host-directed therapy. So today I will talk really about translational TB and to cover these topics, as I was told by our chairperson. And I will start with host-directed therapy. But first, let me look a little bit on immunopathology, because that's central to a better understanding of these um, intervention measures. Now, this is a kind of a overview, as I see it, on immunity to tuberculosis. Some, some, <coughs> sorry, someone coughs in the world, typically in a, um, in a taxi somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, these bush taxis with 50 people in a car that only should cover five in uh, Europe. And 
anyway. And someone coughs and then bacteria are spread. Now what happens then is that these bacteria enter the alveoli of the lung of others and there they are engulfed by many cells, mostly by macrophages, alveolar macrophages, by neutrophils, but also by dendritic cells. Um, sorry, uh, by dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells then bring the bacteria to the draining lymph nodes where T cells are stimulated. And it's the T cells that take the major burden of protection and pathology, although antibodies also play a role. But I won't discuss those, and the evidence still is very vague. Anyway, T cells are activated, and it's both CD4 and CD8 T cells that are activated. They become effectum cells, and then memory T cells. And finally, they do something very interesting, and that is at the, bacteria, at the site of bacterial implantation, a granuloma develops. And it is the granuloma that's really the hallmark of TB. Now, in this solid granuloma that's indicated here, T cells, macrophages interact with each other and they contain the bacteria. Now these are people who are infected, who remain infected, but they are healthy. And that's about 1.7 billion. We normally talked about 2 billion people and already said one third. It's a little bit lower according to uh, uh, more recent um, epidemiologic studies. But still it's about a quarter of all people on this globe who are infected but remain they are healthy. So the immune system does a wonderful job. It contains the bacteria but it's not ideal because it does not eradicate at least in most cases. And therefore all these people you could argue harbor within them a kind of a time bomb. And it's about 5 to 10 percent over the years, mostly in the first two years, but also very late, that people develop disease. The granuloma now becomes caseous and it's no longer helpful. It destroyed, the lung gets destroyed and the bacteria are disseminated. So something has gone wrong and we believe there is a lot of exhaustion and regulation going on. And of course also co-infection, be it helminths, be it atypical environmental bacteria, and of course HIV that cause immune suppression or cause immune exhaustion and therefore disease can develop. Now there's one cell which by purpose I will briefly mention now and that's the myeloid derived cell repressor cells. Let me just indicate now again the data. It's 10, more than 10 million people who developed disease in 2016 and that's actually more than a couple of years ago. So we see unfortunately increase and it's, as I know, and it's about 1.7 million people who died in 2016. That's quite a lot. So let me now, uh, as I said before, focus on a specific cell that has become infamous in cancer immunology, myeloid derived suppressor cells. Uh, they are very vaguely defined cells. Probably it is a kind of a maturation phase and I bring that up only because I'm supposed to talk about host directed therapy. Anyway, to define myeloid derived suppressor cells, that is not easy. And what I would like to call them here is an early stage of maturation and to distinguish them from uh, mononuclear um, uh, macrophages, myeloid cells and neutrophils, we really in the beginning use a double staining for INOS, which is the NO producing enzyme in macrophages or neutrophils, and arginase 1, which is kind of a marker molecule for M2 macrophages, that is macrophages that are not really uh, involved in immunity to TB, but rather immunity to helminths. And if you infect the mouse now with mycobacterium tuberculosis in the lung, what you see is indeed that in these mice a lot of these double positive INOS and ARCH1 positive cells are stained in the lung. So they really accumulate in the lung. Now if you treat these mice with an antibodies against GR1, which not only deletes these MDSCs, but also others. But still, what you see clearly is that it markedly inhibits or impairs the evolvement of these cells. So these cells are attacked by the antibodies and are gone. 
What we then used are two types of mice, namely highly susceptible mice, which almost nobody uses, but I recommend to use them actually in TB, and B6 mice, highly resistant mice. The 120 mice die very rapidly, and the res resistant ones survive a long time, TB infection. Then we isolate the uh, um, myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells, either monocytic or neutrophil-like, and look at them in the lung. And what you see is indeed in both mice, resistant and susceptible, these cells arise in the lung. They come up, they appear in the lung. More importantly, these cells harbor mycobacterium tuberculosis and it's about, on average, 10 to 6 mycobacteria that you find either, either in the neutrophilic or in the myeloid cells. And it's about 30 to 40 percent of the cells that are infected. So these Myeloid-derived suppressor cells are not only immunologically active, but they seem to be a safe harbor, a safe harbor, a protective niche for mycobacteria. So we wondered whether we can harness a treatment of myeloid-derived suppressor cells as a host-directed therapy in an experimental model, and you will see in a minute that this works. What we did is we looked into the literature of cancer, and in cancer it is known that you can use all transretinoic acid to treat even patients to reduce the numbers of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So we did this, and what you see indeed is you can find that ATRA all transretinoic acid indeed reduces the number of the myeloid derived dispropressor cells, reduces also this by immunohistology, and most importantly, what you see here, CFU bacterial load is diminished almost by a load. So, in the experimental model, this host directed therapy approach works. It's not optimal, but it works. And you also see a reduction of the size of granulomas, namely, as indicated actually here in the slide, these large granulomas in placebo treated and then in much smaller ones in ATRA treated. So what I wanted to say is that MDSCs indeed are important regulators in tuberculosis and since there is a molecule which is not it has adverse events and side effects to make it clear, but it shows that by using a molecule like ATRA, a vitamin A derivative, you can use that for host directed therapy. And our colleagues at the Stellenbosch University around Gerhard Walzel also showed that these cells exist in human beings, TB patients, and therefore we have established a collaboration uh, with them to get that into clinical trial. And that brings me now to host-directed therapy. Now, for many reasons, mostly time reasons, I will be very brief on that and give you a, refer a very brief overview, uh, giving, having given you one example. And I will show you that we just published last year a paper in Na Nature Reviews, Drug Discovery, which you may want to read if you want to have more information on TB, but also on viral infections. So what is host-directed therapy? The background is that pathogens that cause chronic infections, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, but many others, hepatitis, HIV, they misuse host immune responses, otherwise they would be eradicated. So either they uh, reverse or they subvert um, uh, uh, host defenses, and therefore you can use biologics like antibodies, or you can use small molecules to kind of come back to the original situation, that is to strengthen the host response. And um, biologics, of course, we know from cancer that there are antibodies now in the treatment, um, which I will mention briefly. And small molecules, mind you, there is no need actually at this stage to develop new ones, but rather repurpose those that are already there and are used for many other reasons. So host directed troops, sorry, that's uh, again, I'm somehow confused with this direction. Anyway, now this is a macrophage which is, has eaten mycobacterium tuberculosis. And I will now show you very briefly what can be done. Oops, sorry. Oops, poop, 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 poop. First, you can trigger activation either by cytokines or by PDE inhibitors, that's like Zindefil, uh, um, uh, or in other words, Viagra, which is known to stimulate an NO production. You can use 
um, uh, compounds that induce antimicrobial peptides. Vitamin D is a very typical one. You can inhibit lipid formation by statins, which are used to uh, reduce um, uh, fat, uh, high fat uh, cholesterol and um, um, the lipids in the blood. And you can also use uh, agents like metformin, the compound worldwide for diabetes treatment to promote phagosome maturation. And finally, also, you can trigger autophagy. And later, we'll show autophagy is a very important factor in defense against TB by many, many compounds you wouldn't believe. So this makes you wonder also, if you take one of these drugs, uh, what can happen if you uh, would also suffer from TB? So many, as I said, of these drugs are just considered for repurpose rather than as new drugs for TB. And that, of course, has a lot of consequences for, white, uh, for clinical trials because you can very uh, easily go into bridging studies and then go on much faster. At the tissue level, the granuloma, which I mentioned before, you can also use a lot of um, interventions. And I will very, very briefly again talk a little bit about those in, on the um, necrotic solid granuloma and then on the caseous granuloma. And again, in the principle is either to be increasing inflammation or reducing inflammation. And again, I will be very brief on that. So MDS, myeloid-derived suppressor cell differentiation, I also talked already about. And uh, cytokine signaling is another mechanism you can use. And obviously, then checkpoint blockade, which we learned such a lot. And I think it's good to see that ultimately, infectious disease immunology and intervention measures learn from cancer. Cancer has often learned from uh, infectious disease immunology. And now we learn that checkpoint blockade can also be used for chronic infectious diseases. Uh, then on the way from a necrotic to a caseous granuloma, there are a number of um, mechanisms also. And again, the PDE inhibitor, cytokine signaling, and a very tricky glucocorticoids. But that's a very tricky approach also, because you never really know at this stage what comes out. But anyway, they are considered. Now, this is all dreaming about future intervention measures. And then finally, at the caseous granuloma, you may want to suppress or impair inflammation, which is so excessive, by um, introducing mesenchymal stem cells. Actually, there is already clinical trials out on that in South Africa and Eastern Europe to dampen the host response. You may want to um, reduce the vascularization to inhibit influx of mycobacteria or transmission of mycobacteria to other organs, and finally also to avoid collateral damage, you may use uh, metallo matrix metalloproteinases or impair the immunometabolism under hypoxic conditions. Now, probably that was far too much for you, but I just want to give an overview. Again, I indicate to you that we had that review recently appearing, and I think, and actually these slides are from that review, and you may want to look at this if you want to have more details. Let me now come to a field which I'm much more familiar with, and that's TB biomarkers and then the new TB vaccine. So about 15 years ago, actually now, we started with the support from the Gates Foundation to uh, analyze a very simple hypothesis. And that is, what makes it that some people get disease and others remain healthy? So we are talking about the 1.7 billion people who are infected but remain healthy, at least over the observation period, and those who develop disease, the 10.4 million people, as I mentioned before, who develop disease. So this is how we approached that. We looked for biosignatures, and then we did a lot of systems biology, obviously, and we looked for biosignatures on the cytokine level, which was mentioned earlier today, on transcripts, deep sequencing, and also on metabolomics. And we looked at signatures first that allow us to differentially diagnose those who are diseased from those who are healthy. And later, and that's just completed now, we look also at those who are healthy but will develop the disease tomorrow. So can we identify or prognose people today who will develop disease tomorrow? And it works. 
let me very briefly show you. Now, this is a kind of a compilation of all studies in the world, our own data, published, unpublished, and all published data. And what you see in this three-dimensional um, 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 picture here with uh, three principal components, it's actually quite easy to distinguish yellow from blue and green, which means we can distinguish tuberculosis from other diseases, of course, only those that had been analyzed, like HIV, and healthy. And healthy always means that they are not TB diseased. You never know. These are all studies, mostly in South Africa, but also in other places in Sub-Saharan Africa. You never know whether they have helminth infections or so. And some people argue then, and that's the bench people. So how can you do such um, dirty quotation mark studies? That's nonsense. It works still, and that's what you want. And you want to go into the real world rather than do that in mice, as we heard before, actually, which are under very controlled conditions. So it works nicely. On the diagnostic level. And this is the data that really show you how well it works. You have about, you, I don't know whether you know these rock curves. If not, we have to ex I have to explain it later. That shows you how sensitive and how s sensi uh, specific the assay is. And what it tells you is the assay, uh, the assay has more than 80% sensitivity and more than 80% specificity, where about 85 to 90%. That's very good, actually. So it works, and we can distinguish as I said before, both TB versus other diseases and TB versus healthiness. I normally talk only about um, the markers, and I will very briefly go to the markers, but we really want to mention here, it's not so important which markers you use. Of course, there is certain markers that work and others don't. But within a set of markers, you can choose different ones, because if A is positive, then you may use B. If C is positive, you may use D. So there is a variability, and that's the secret, in very simple words, of the systems biology process to use the model how the markers are selected and you come up with very few markers that work. So markers that normally work is CFC gamma receptor, it's lactoferrin in iron uptake and it's GBPs which are under the control of IFN for example. And if you use those we can show a more than 85% sensitivity and specificity in West Africa, in East Africa and in South Africa. Now Africa is a very diverse continent, some people forget that, but this is clearly very important for us because we wanted to have a pan-African uh, signature ultimately. So it works at different sites in Africa, not all sites tested, but at least three different sites. It has then also been done in Bangalore, India, where it very well worked as well, and it has been done in ba Minsk, below Russia, where it also works, also this has not been published. And only three to four markers are sufficient, and actually, as I said before, it is a cloud of markers than to you use and it's the bioinformatics behind it that allows you to do it. So transcripts work very well. We also did metabolomics and some people already talked about metabolites without showing data. We did it already and this is one study where we use metabolomics um, in controls, latent infected individuals, people with active disease and here we need about 15 to 20 markers but then again it's very very it's very, very um, 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 uh, sensitive and specific with more than 90%. So it works very well also with metabolites. A few metabolites are inosine and methionine on hypoxia induced, and that makes sense because the granuloma is hypoxic. We find fibrinopeptides. Again, that makes sense, teleologically speaking, because the granuloma is surrounded by fibrin, uh, fibrinogenic wall. And then lysophosphatidylcholines, which are in indicative for apoptosis and other forms of death, also make sense. And the tryptophan metabolism, which is well known as the IDO mechanism of immunosuppression. So in principle, markers also work. By, uh, it's much more expensive because every marker, every metabolite needs its own diagnostic assay, and therefore it's much more complicated. Our dream was to have a dipstick with some antibodies to put into kind of urine or blood and then see what's positive, but that turns out to be more complicated. But one time that may work. 
So what about TB prognosis? After all, diagnostics everybody in the field now sees, and that's now in discussion with WHO, that this is very promising for the future. And believe it or not, that already would be a great advantage. Now let me talk about prognosis. That's the study we started, as I said before, some 15 years ago. Um, recruitment, uh, oh, oh, sorry. So that's how the study is going. So <coughs> someone coughs again. That's the index case, because that person has been diagnosed as a TB patient somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the index case. Important, but more important, are the household contacts. So the people who live together with the index case are asked, are you going, are you going um, to uh, accept to go into that study? And then their blood is drawn immediately after exposure, six months, 18 months, 24 months afterwards. And what comes up was quite disappointing, actually, from our standpoint, but gratifying from the standpoint of the patients only 2 point something, 2.2 percent actually developed disease. They were not protected. 97.8 percent, almost 98 percent did not develop disease over the first two years, much lower than everybody had predicted. But anyway, that's why it was. So we had to, uh, had to increase recruitment, and that's why it took longer. Ultimately, we came up with 97 TB cases that went into our study. Data were analyzed, and this is not a perfect study, to make it clear. These are different sites in Africa, and who has worked there, like you, I mean, knows that this is very difficult. Anyway, what we came up is about 70% specificity and 60% sensitivity, so we have to work on it to get better data, but that's how it looks like, either with metabolomics or with transcriptomics. Oops. Now, it's, as I said, ten. now can this be generalized? Now, there was another study led by a South African group with whom we also were tightly interacting. That's the adolescent cohort study that was focused only one place in Africa, the adolescent uh, population, and there it also worked. And we can exchange our data. That is, our data work on the adolescent cohort, and their data work on our Grand Challenge uh, uh, cohort. So we are quite confident. As I said, it's a early early stage, but with 60 to 70 percent, GC6, that's our study, can predict the adolescent and vice versa. And now this is how it looks like for one principal component only. And what you see here, it's about 12 months before disease is diagnosed. So the point zero is disease. It's not 24 months, it's diagnosis of disease. And then we go back, and what you see here, that's how it develops. Here they are close together. Don't, you may discuss there is a little bit higher, but this is not with a statistically significant here the two curves get out, uh, uh, get uh, different pathways. And that's where you can start to analyze. Now, um, let me repeat, we can do diagnosis and prognosis. We, we detect now disease progression, which is prognosis. But as I will show you immediately now, it's not really, it's actually not, well, you, it's semantics. It's uh, what it is, we will come back. Originally, this was uh, defined as uh, 16 transcripts needed. We are now down to about four transcripts. A lot of different uh, systems biology approaches, but it works now quite nicely both with the metabolomics and the um, and the transcript and we already have uh, written the paper up on the multi-platform analysis as it was mentioned together by to to this morning by Toby if you take different platforms it's even better and indeed that's the case if you take metabolomics and transcripts oops where are we now Okay, now this is what we really see, and you can call it a diagnostic and not a prognostic signature. Because what you see is, normally you talk about latent infection, that's the healthy ones, which I mentioned before, healthy but infected. Here are the diseased ones, and there's something in between, which I want to bring up here, and that's subclinical disease. Now all the markers which prognose TB later are already seen during diagnosis of active TB. 
So there is no difference. You just need a few more because some are sub-threshold. There is no difference between the prognostic and the diagnostic markers. So transcripts indicate that this person will develop disease because it has already a subclinical stage of disease. We call that subclinic TB. And subclinical TB is not seen by the, uh, by the doctor, the MD, but it's seen by the transcript analysis. And that's what we see. And that's why 12 months later, 6 to 12 months, these people develop disease. Because a subclinical disease, we have to propose, at least in almost all cases, will go into disease. And that's actually a weight major point here. That is, there is no way of return. And what's that good for? First, now you can prevent disease before it has developed. That is, you can give a drug or a drug combination to an individual who will never suffer from TB if you offer that person 6 to 12 months before disease drug treatment. That's currently tested in South Africa. And second, it will be helpful, and that comes, uh, brings us to the last story, uh, it will be helpful for clinical trials. If you take recruit only individuals, stratify for those individuals who will be likely developing disease, then the number of study participants obviously is much lower. And that's good for drug testing, but also for, of course, obviously also for vaccine testing. And I will come back to that at the very end of my talk. So anyway, so preventive therapy before anybody develops disease and before he, he or she transmits disease, that's also important. So suddenly now, therapy can also interfere with transmission and spread of the disease. Let me now come to the last part, that's the uh, vaccine. And particularly in France, we have also always have to ask, why do we need, actually, do we need a vaccine? We have BCG, Basile calmet guerin developed about 90, 100 years ago, which went into clinical trial, quotation mark, was not a real trial in 1921. And in 1927, it was shown that it protects newborn, which were born into a family where a TB case, active TB case was very profoundly. That's true. But then people thought if it works in children, and that's just the opposite way, as we discussed it this morning, then it should also work in adults, and that failed. Now we know that TB, uh, BCG does not really work. You can always talk about some percentages or so. Let me just simply say, does not really work in adults. Actually, we know now that it doesn't even work perfectly in newborn, and a lot, lot of babies still die in South Africa, despite they have been BCG vaccinated. So BCG only prevents miliary TB, disseminated TB. It does not prevent lung TB in any age group. And that's important now. So we think better vaccines are clearly needed. This is the list of vaccines that are currently under clinical investigation, clinical trials. I'm not going into that because I want to focus on one, and that's our own, who has just reached on January 5 the phase 3 with the first injection, and then suddenly has become actually a front runner. Also, it was always kind of an orphan type of vaccine because it was an academia uh, vaccine that only very late found a sponsor, a, vac a vaccine producer, as we discussed it briefly. Uh, today. So what it tells you here is that in blue, these are, this is the JSK vaccine, protein adjuvant formulations in blue. In yellow, it's a killed vaccine. In red, this is vir virus vectors, be it adeno or MVA, modified vaccinia Ankara, and so on. And um, then we have in green two live vaccines. And I will now focus, and I clearly uh, declare conflict of interest, our own vaccine. Um, and um, uh, we'll show you where we are now. Now, VPM today, as it is called now, because of the people who license it, is the most advanced live vaccine. And actually, now it's the most advanced uh, vaccine. It is based on BCG. To make that clear, we thought Calmet and Gerber did quite a good job. BCG stimulates mostly CD4 T cells that contains the bacteria. It's not sufficiently active in eradicating the bacteria. Let us see how immunology can tell us to improve BCG. And that started many, many years ago, actually. But I will give you a short overlook. We, will, uh, we are now using it both for pre-exposure in neonates, a study that will, a phase 2B study that will start later this year in South Africa, and 
for post exposure for adults. So it's both actually. And we can discuss that uh, in more details, but I'll show you. So the idea behind was actually st stemming from my very early studies in the late 70s, early 80s, that Listeria monocytogenes, which is an intracellular bacterium, is not, you are not protected against Listeria by CD4 T cells, as the dogma was, but by CD8 T cells. And the reason for that is that Listeria egress into the cytosol, and we now know they behave, immunologically speaking, like a virus. So its antigens are loaded on MHC1 and CD8 T cells are stimulated. BCG, in contrast, remains in the phagosome and therefore is mostly um, uh, targeted by CD4 T cells. Now we thought, why don't we, don't we take Listerolysine, which is responsible for aggression into the cytosol, better say the gene, introduce it in BCG. So what we did is, we exchanged the urease gene in BCG with the Listerolysine gene. We did that because urease neutralizes the phagosome and Listerolysine needs an acidic pH. Um, Urease is just uh, involved in ammonia production. Every chemist can tell you, or every schoolboy or your girl can tell you that it produces ammonia and that neutralizes the phagosome. So what we had now is a vaccine that expresses listerolysin and allows for the correct uh, pH in the phagosome. And this is the study which we published um, um, in, um, I don't know, about 10 years ago or eight years ago, we'll see in a minute. Um, and that is how it goes. We take mice, vaccinate them with BCG or recombinant BCG, and then we wait a long time, some 120 days. That's a long time for mouse immunology. And then we wait another 220 days or oh, no, 200 days actually. But at here we infect the mice by aerosol with mycobacterium tuberculosis. We use the lab strain H37RV or a clinical isolate and then we see how the infection develops, that is the bacterial load develops. And what you see after about 200 days or 180 to 220 days of challenge infection is that BCG protects about tenfold. That is a tenfold reduction. That's not bad. In immunology speaking, that's one log difference. And TB uh, and the recombinant BCG protects about hundredfold, so it's tenfold better. Now, when we use the Beijing genotype, we showed that BCG doesn't work. That was the first time and it's been repeated by many people now. So here, BCG fails, but if you use the vaccine, it's still a hundredfold better. So now we are even hundredfold better against the clinical isolate than BCG. So this vaccine gives a strong protection, and that's really strong because it's about 95%. But mind you, it's not a sterile eradication. We have to keep that in mind. We would like that, but nobody ever succeeded in that. So that's pre-exposure. What about post-exposure? We have addressed this as well, and I will show you very briefly the data. This is how that goes. Oops, um, excuse me. So here we uh, infect mice, let the bacteria with mycobacterium tuberculosis, again H37 or also Beijing, let it grow. Then we treat the mice with antibiotics, go down to less than 10 bacteria per lung. So this is almost sterile eradication, also not complete. Then we vaccinate the mice at this stage, and then, oops, I'm kind of getting problems with that. And then we get, see that in the mice, after treatment, bacteria come back. In the vaccinated mice, we still see some protection of more than a lock in the day 250, both in the lung and in the spleen. So it also works post-exposure, and you will see why that is important because we have a clinical trial now on. So let's go back to priming very briefly in an overview slide. <laughs> Later we found that aggression of the antigen into the cytosol is important, but probably not the most important one, because we saw apoptosis. And what we saw is that apoptotic plebs are uh, produced uh, under in the recombinant BCG. The apoptotic plebs contain mycobacterial antigens. These are taken up by the dendritic cells, and that's a process that's well known as cross-priming. Later, we found actually that also autophagy and inflammasome activation takes place, and we consider this very important. So first we see that the bacterial components get out, the vaccine components get out. It's not only proteins that are enclosed in these phagosome, uh, in these uh, apoptotic plebs. It's also DNA, and it's double-strand DNA, which leads to the stimulation of AIM2, and that activates the inflammasome, and it also activates um, the 
um, the uh, autophagy. And that's been published. You can read about it. So now we see apoptosis and autophagy induced by the bacterial components because of the aggression into the cytosol. What that leads now is to CD4 and CD8 T uh, cell stimulation. We then found out that not only Th1 but also Th17 cells are induced. And later we found that um, uh, there is a big advantage with this vaccine. In the, this is all preclinical in stimulating central memory and follicular helper cells. Where are we now? First, we showed it's highly efficient. I gave you some uh, data on that, but it's also safe. Then we had to go through all this regulatory stuff. P1 level had been approved. Mind you, this is a GMO. This is Germany we had to go through, and Ge Germany is very strict on these things. So finally, we got it approved as a genetically modified organism of P1. GMP production has been then solved by fermentation. This is the first BCG to tell you, surprisingly, believe it or not, that has been produced by fermentation and got into humans. All other classical BCGs is, believe it or not, still the old-fashioned culture in a flask. Incredible. Um, um, that's actually why Staten Serum Institute in Copenhagen gave it up, because they had a, a, that's the story, that the glass flakes were broken and the money was not there to buy new glass flakes. So this is fermentation. Hygromycin, the resistance marker, has been reduced. Then we license it to a German kind of broker for vaccines, Vaccine Project Management, and they called it VPM. And then they sub-licensed it to Serum Institute India. Believe it or not, um, uh, but particularly in Lyon, this is the largest vaccine producer in the world, not by income, but by uh, vaccine doses. So they are normally the suppliers for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, so it's in good hands. But it's also um, a, a company that's mostly used to spend little money on research, um, and therefore we had to have a lot of discussions how to get that ongoing, but it's now ongoing. So a phase one trial has been completed already in 2009. The vaccine is immunogenic and has no side effects as far as we can say, so it's safe in adults. Then we went into a phase one trial in adults again, that's male adults typically, as we heard before, in South Africa, a highly endemic area. And then we immediately went into neonates. So it was a phase 2A trial with the original target population. It's safe in neonates and it is also immunogenic in neonates. And then we started a phase 2 trial in South Africa, which has already been completed in HIV exposed and unexposed newborn, as you may um, um, know that uh, BCG is not endorsed by the government of South Africa in HIV exposed in, uh, in neonates and therefore we were actually interested in also seeing whether ours is more safe. Didn't show you the data but all animal data indicate that our vaccine is safer than BCG even in immunocompromised animals. So that's the next step and this study will and I'll come back very briefly in that uh, soon. Uh, once it's unblinded and shown to be safe in neonates who have been HIV exposed, this will go immediately and directly into a phase 3 trial, 2B3 trial. That is, the same population that had been employed already for this study will also be employed for, a, for the study on efficacy, and you save 400 um, individuals in your study finally. And that's what we call adoptive trial design. So things like that are possible. And now, just to mention that to the cancer people, as you know, BCG is also used as as a therapeutic for bladder cancer. The vaccine has also been tested for bladder cancer actually in Switzerland. It looks very, very promising here in those people who do not accept BCG because of adverse events. So this is a very selected group who do not tolerate BCG, but they tolerated the vaccine. We still don't know whether it protects, but at least it's safe and much more tolerable in individuals that do not tolerate um, um, uh, BCG for bladder cancer. Now this brings us to a very important question which we heard before and that is how to finance this all. And I will show you a few uh, examples how we think about it. Reduce number of participants, shorter trial duration. Let us now just assume that you need about 200 individuals who develop TB in a clinical trial. That is clearly a minimal estimate, probably underpowered. Let's just assume this is a kind of food for thought game now. So that means, believe 
believe it or not, that means if we take a high endemic area, less than 1 in 100 will develop TB. That's already a high, high assumption in the most endemic areas in South Africa, suburban uh, places, um, uh, townships in near Cape Town, between Cape Town and um, Stellenbosch, for example. So that means you need a group, if you want to have five individuals develop disease, you need 500, and you come up with something like 20,000 participants. I just calculate $1,000 or euros, whatever you prefer, per individual, and that's realistic. So you come up with 200 million. That's a lot of money, because you want to follow it over five years. How can you reduce that? Next point. We are going into babies, that's already five-fold higher incidence, believe it or not, despite BCG, these babies have a higher incidence than adults, despite BCG vaccination, so you go on with that. What you need now, 2,000 people for 100 individuals, babies who will develop TB, and now you calculate, you need about 2,000 per group, one BCG, one recombinant, our BCG, you come up with 4,000 people, some 8,000 uh, per group, 8,000 because you have two groups, BCG and vaccine, over two years, that's 16 million. That's already a lot of money, but still, that's clearly a reduction by a factor of five, obviously, and shorter time period. And that's what we do, as I told you before. This is the phase 2, 3 multicenter efficacy trial in HIV-exposed babies, which we, I told you already has been done on a safety level in a phase 2A study and will hopefully start later this year. I mentioned already BCG is not endorsed for HIV-exposed neonates, so we want to show here that pre-exposure -pre BCG replacement shows better safety and better efficacy. Even if it's over safety, we hope that we can go on, because at least for that population, HIV-exposed babies, it would be, of course, a big advantage to have a vaccine that's safe and still works. Further trial, and that's the trial we now started just uh, uh, very shortly, um, uh, recently in uh, India. Now let's assume someone already has TB that person got treated and got cured. Believe it or not, 10% of those people who had been cured of tuberculosis, not talking about MDR, multi-drug resistant, classical canonical TB, 10% will develop TB within a year. Now this is interesting, it's either, we call it recurrence because we do not know whether it's relapse, that is endogenous reactivation of some hidden bacteria which were not attacked by the drugs, or whether it's reinfection. We're talking about India, highly endemic area where you get reinfection every now and then. So that's the group we are now looking at. There are 100 people, they get treated, 90% remain healthy, 10% develop disease. Perhaps they have some subclinical TB or it's reinfection, as I told you before. And that means that we need 1,000 people for 100 cases or 2,000 people for 200 cases. So now we talk about 2,000 participants per group, some 4,000 total over one year, 4 million. That's quite a reduction, and that's exactly what we are now doing in India. It's a phase 2, 3 multicenter efficacy trial. Here's the number if you want to look it up. And um, the goal is to prevent TB recurrence. Now this is not the real goal of a vaccine. You don't want someone first get disease and then try again to prevent the second. It is a kind of a vaccine, a very special group of vaccinees, but it's mostly also an experimental medicine approach. That's why I show it to you. If we know if it works here, then we would go on. But we will see. It's clearly a high-risk group with 10% recurrence within one year, and that's why what we do now, it is two groups, VPM and control, because BCG is not indicated in that case, 2,000 participants. We submitted this all, or better say the uh, Indian Serum Institute, Serum Institute India submitted it in 2016, and believe it or not, finally the first individual had been vaccinated on January 5. We've been waiting there for a couple of months, but that's how things work out in complex issues, in complex situations.
Now one last example, and now I come back to the biomarkers, and then I'm done, and you go for lunch. <laughs> now, at, as I told you before, we identified individuals who develop <coughs> disease uh, by biomarkers. Remember? And these were about three in hundred. I should correct that because we found out finally it's about two point something. But let's just assume three develop disease, and we can now analyze those by biomarker studies. That means now that we have 200 people to have 130 subclinical cases. Because, um, because um, these people, if you sort them out, um, will develop disease, uh, those we can prognose to develop disease. Now that means now that we need about 300 participants per group, some 600 total over a year, and that's below a million. Now this is cheating, I have to confess, we did, uh, because I did not calculate the cost for the biomarkers. But once we have that established, it goes down dramatically. It still is the lowest cost I can think of, but clearly what I calculated here by purpose is only the vaccine trial and not the uh, biomarker study beforehand. So Stradivy, that's the important message, is stratifying for individuals in a clinical trial with high TB risk, be it subclinical TB or else what else, but I think it's subclinical TB, reduces numbers of study participants, it shortens trial duration and therefore dramatically reduces the cost. But, and that is a very important caveat, we may be too ambitious. Because what we do is we go into individuals who either had been treated for TB because they had TB before, or we identified people with subclinical TB. And you may argue these people may not be prevented anymore. We don't know. And I agree on that, but I think it's important that we do such a study. And I'm actually uh, very, um, happy perhaps the wrong word, but I think now there is this coming up, this idea that we have to take cautious, to be cautious, obviously, but we have to take certain risks, otherwise we will never make it. So we take the risk to go into a study of people who have a high, high likelihood to develop TB. We do not know whether the vaccine indeed can prevent the TB in such individuals with subclinical TB or recurrence of TB, but I think it's worth to test it and to know if we fail, that this may be different in the other group, but if we succeed here, then it would be clearly some approach to go on. And I'm indeed dumb. So WHO in 2015 claimed we want to reduce TB by cases by 90% and deaths by 95%. Now this is extremely ambitious and uh, for years I've been more, for a couple of years, I mean this was discussed in the 2013, I was very critical. But now that we have biomarkers that are ready for the field that can diagnose and even prognose TB and therefore also can prevent transmission and that we will have a vaccine data by 2020 I get a little bit more optimistic and I think the world seems to recognize that as you may know the United Nations only had four topics on the highest level on health issues in 2011 non-communicable diseases then Ebola AIDS antimicrobial resistance and in September this year there will be such a high level meeting on tuberculosis because there is a political will after years of work, really, that tuberculosis should be conquered because otherwise we get kind of a big issues and there are data which are very pessimistic but uh, which really say that TB will go up again. So the first meeting was in Moscow, strongly supported by the Moscow government. I'm not going into this uh, political issue further, but anyway, it was strongly recommended to go on. There will be the uh, next meeting in Delhi and then later the year in 2018 we will have that meeting in New York at the UN headquarters to see what can be done for TB and I'm very um, glad to see that it's of course field studies that is um, availability of 
vaccines that are there, of drugs that are there, but it's also in their research and development. And that all started on the G20 meeting, which was taking place last year in Germany, and also strongly supported by the French government. OK, this is the people, and then I'm done. Um, this is the people on the vaccine field over the last couple of years, the people in our institute on the biomarkers. This is General Weiner, who is the bioinformatician who does most of the work. And the little bit of wet lab data on MDSCs were done by Anka uh, Doho and Julia Knaul. The place we are situated is in the middle of Berlin, just opposite of the uh, government uh, center here. Uh, so this on, on the end on the Charité campus. And, um, the biomarker studies were really done, a lot of efforts with seven sites in Africa and seven sites all over the world. It was a privilege to do that as a PI, but it was also giving some gray hair for me over the years, but that was worth it. And then finally the vaccine trials, vaccine project management by Leander Grode, Ben Eisel and many others. Stellenbosch University, that's where the clinical trials in South Africa have been taking place with Mark Cotton as the leader. Serum Institute of India with Umesh Shaligram and many colleagues are now involved in the Indian trial. And the cancer trial, the bladder cancer trial, was done by Sarah Range in University Clinics Basel. And I think now it's time to stop and have lunch. Thank you. I have to take another position now. Questions, comments? Thank you for the talk. Um, Thank you for this marvelous presentation. You did not discuss the, the, the potential use of your vaccine as a therapeutic approach. Yeah, yeah because uh, that is not my main topic. Um, so bladder cancer uh, uh, is a t the treatment for bladder cancer. No, 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 no not for bladder cancer, oh. during, a, uh, during a TB infection to, to, to shorten the duration of treatment as yes. a, a, a therapeutic uh, vaccine approach in, uh, in patients that are currently yes. uh, infected with TB, with uh, oh, yes. active TB. The next, well, we this, or this Indian um, Serum Institute India decided we go for a recurrent study. If that works, the next step will be prevention of um, disease in already infected individuals. As I said before, I was careful, recurrence, it could be relapse, and we are sure some cases are relapse. That is a post-exposure vaccine of someone who has been infected and remains infected, but it's also reinfection prevention, so I was careful not to say a post-exposure, classical post-exposure vaccine. The next step, once we see data on the recurrence, prevention, prevention of recurrence or POR, we go in prevention of disease or prevention of re, yeah, prevention of disease in post exposure. POD. Is that okay? So Stefan you mentioned so that in your signature, your prognostic signature yeah. The genes that you identified were also shared by the uh, active TB signature. Yeah. So, is it a matter of, uh, it's a, is it a specific set that would reflect actually, uh, I would say, a particular uh, clinical situation? Is it just a matter of sensitivity and then in such a case, for instance, yes. by targeting well, for instance, either antibody-based, hypersensitive yeah. antibody-based uh, approach yes. would uh, improve uh, yeah. this? That, that's, uh, that's a very uh, important question, and I may have oversimplified. I still to stick to what I said. So what we see is, we see 16 transcripts in the original publication, and then we go into the literature, our own studies, unpublished or published, or the literature, and we find somewhere is a study on diagnostic signature which has shown that this is part of their signature. Now, um, that is why I called it a, a subclinical TB signature. It looks like, an, um, and I have a game, let me give you two sentences. It looks like a pro-inflammatory response. And that is, of course, then you would say it's also in other diseases. As far as we can tell, and I showed you some data on the diagnostic, it's still TB specific. You will always find an overlap. So what we claim is what you, okay, 
that's the first thing. It's a sensitivity issue. Transcripts are better than MDs. I'm sorry to say it that way, but that hopefully then people understand what I mean. That, 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 and, and, and of course you don't. But nowadays, if you look, if you work in psychology and look at the books in the US every year, you have 10% more psychologic diseases. Not because there are more cases, but oops, some people are now called you have a disease. I remember, so well, I'm not going into that. Yeah, anyway. So, so what it means is that people might already have certain lesions that harm their uh, lung activity, but they're not diagnosed as TB patients. And uh, some, what we know, for example, there are in our studies, the clinicians saw some people, even acid fast bacilli were found, and then they were healed again. We have to see that in a more complex tissue, eh? if you have a small lesion that opens into the alveoli, and you are at the right time, you are uh, uh, taking sputum, you will find some. And then this closes, and it's gone again. So what I want to say, sensitivity on an overall, and the blood really measures overall. It does not look at this lesion or that lesion. We are more sensitive with transcripts and metabolites. However, uh, if the doctor looks at the right time, he or she may see, oh, there is some signs, and that goes away again. So you may discuss if you want to treat it or not. That's open to a long discussion. This is early studies. We have to go into it more carefully. But what we see is, on an overall picture, it's more sensitive as uh, compared to the, what is it called, screenshot of one day looking at someone. You may find one, but you may not find others, and so on. So it's more complex, actually. And I tried to simplify a little bit, I thought. Um, so I take all the risk of having something uh, simplified. But, but the question really has been accepted. We either call it incipient or subclinical. I prefer the term subclinical. That's a little bit more easy, understandable. The question now is, is subclinical a way of no return? Is it always going into disease, or are there still a certain percentage? Clearly, the number of people get into disease, I think, is clear, is higher than those who are not subclinical. But it's still not clarified. And that is the problem for the vaccine approach, where you go into someone like that, whether the vaccine helps. The reason, the reason why you get actually a low, rather low frequency of uh, latently infected people that uh, went yeah. into active TB, is it because in this particular setting, the problem is that what is yeah. quite difficult to understand why a latent patient will go into an active yes. TB. Is it a matter of reinfection because they are chronically yes. re-exposed yes. actually in an yes. endemic environment? So you learn a lot about TB, Mark, <laughs> now. Yeah. So there is now a, high, a highly attractive theory going around. I think there is worse to mention it. If, you, if I take too much time, I'm no longer, uh, I'm now just a speaker and no longer, I can't now separate. So you just tell me. time for the lunch so we can reduce. You tell me when it's done. Um, so, so, um, so, um, sorry, so one theory now is, if um, um, disease develops if you have a lot of reinfections. So you get an infection and you get it every day, then you have a higher risk. Then th and that's why in India, I claim many of the people who develop disease may be just highly susceptible individuals who get reinfected. They got TB the first time. They are amongst the 10% to develop disease. They get reinfected again. And again, in our household context, I do not know. I just know, and some others may confirm that, that that in all clinical studies, everybody normally underestimates numbers of the interesting group, and that is also what we did. We calculated 5% and we underestimate, oh, sorry, overestimate, over, sorry, overestimate. Everybody normally overestimates those numbers, and then under the clinical trial studies where people are more careful and so on, uh, maybe that this is environmental or whatever, numbers are lower or proportions are lower. Anyway, we come up with this, and some people already consider this an interesting interesting data that within the first two years only two point something percent developed disease. Uh, thank you for the talk, of yeah. course. Uh, I am fine, so um, I, I cannot uh, be, uh, you know, I am very happy to so, uh, going back into the mechanism of the VPM vaccines is yeah. working, you have uh, recalled that uh, uh, CD80 cells protect against Listeria and the vaccine used the Listeriolysin. Can you comment on the CD8 um, 
uh, activation in tuberculosis versus with yep. BCG vaccines versus yep. with the VPM vaccine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I thought I'm not going too much into history when some people hadn't even been born. We showed for the first time that CD8 T cells participate in TB in the early 80s, in 1884 or so. Others looked at the same experiment, um, did the same experiment, but they used BCG. At that time, people mostly thought BCG and TB in mice, that's the same. And they only found CD4 T cells. So they got the publication in a higher ranking journal, but that's okay. And we probably finally were, were, were proven to be correct. Everybody accepts now that both in humans and in mice and other um, um, the studies, uh, CD8 T cells play a role. I speculated over the 80s that the function would be first, you have no MHC restriction like, I mean, MHC restriction of course exists, but class two is restricted to antigen presenting cells. The, some cells are, uh, some bacteria are hidden in epithelial cells, and therefore you could argue that MHC allows um, um, t attack of, of, of epithelial cells, which indeed are infected. And then of course we have this idea that, um, uh, that you need a kind of a mechanism first kill the uh, cells and then have activated macrophages. And finally, the most likely is they produce the cytokines you need. It's also IFN gamma. So I would actually think mostly it is also uh, focusing on the cytokines. And of course, Barry Bloom and, um, and, and, and Robert Modley then had that paper out also that CD8 T cells by the mean of uh, help of defense genes uh, can also contribute to a unique mechanism of bacterial uh, of the, um, um, of of bacterial killing. So that it's still incredibly unclear what is the precise role of the CD8 T cells. I went out of it, I have to confess. Also in the vaccine trial to see some CD8s, by the way, also INK T cells uh, seem to be involved in that. Um, some were published over the last year, I forgot it actually. Uh, but um, uh, so it is complex and ultimately it became this kind of vaccinologist, if I may say so, if I see an effect, I go on and, um, and, and still want to understand it, but I want to see first the effect and then the understanding. Nobody would have been interested in spending years on the fine mechanism of a vaccine that's not going into humans, and we would not have, and I have to think of postdocs who want nice publications, then they would say, okay, there's another vaccine in animals, nobody knows what it does, and he chose this or that. Now that it is, now that it is in a phase three trial, we do much more efforts than over the last years in understanding the mechanism. And ideally, we want to actually do that in humans uh, directly, in vitro, and biomarkers. So we are probably getting the financial support through REPORT, which is this HIV support mechanism in clinical trials from the NIH for the TB trial, because in India they didn't find any reason to go into a vaccine trial, HIV vaccine trial, and I will probably support that, and then I hope we learn more from the biomarkers, yeah. And the monitoring of the neonates? So neonates is EDCTP. Um, I make now again another bias. I'm, bought, I'm on the board of the EDCTP, the European Development Country Trial Site. And I think you once also had been in contact with it. Just to make another choice, that an alternative to a Big Pharma would be at least intermediary, also the European Development Country Trial um, Partnership, um, which supports now four TB trials, vaccine trials, in phase 2B over the next years, which is an enormous amount of financial commitment by European countries, including France, Germany, Switzerland, and uh, England, of course, also. Yeah. May I ask you just a final comment? How easy was the technology transfer to serum? And what regulatory challenges yeah. you encountered? Did they require you to do bridging studies? Yes. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit on, you know, was it the right yes. timing? You know, well, of course, uh, it's yes. a huge success to have serum involved, but yes. how much did you have to go back yes. to go? Yeah. <laughs> First, I have to give a lot of credit to VPM, I have to say. They did that, really. And I was more than happy that they did that at real low cost, actually. So we did some of, we did the trial, uh, we did the bridging study 
studies, that is, we had to show that the vaccine inoculum that was given to them also still showed the same data preclinically. They had to do one bridging study also to show safety and then they could go on uh, immediately. So what I showed you is actually a phase two, three trial. It starts with phase two and again as soon as you see that it's um, accepted and has no adverse event goes on. I think that's um, so So probably um, I can only credit this to VPM aside that we did the wet lab studies yeah, and uh, did test the inoculum. There was first this fer fermentation study where we showed that it works with fermented bacteria. They put in the fermentation and um, we had to retest that. We did that, yeah. But it was not that much. Surprisingly little, actually. I and mean, even this, if I talk to some people, they always tell me phase two, phase three immediately, which is um, is impossible. Or so somewhere, some places it seems to work, both in South Africa and India. Okay, thank you. Okay, now it's done.